Kubernetes is an awesome system that provides a standard interface for managing deployment of your applications across many different machines in the cloud or bare metal. But once you've deployed those applications, it's not always easy to monitor and observe them. In this video, I'm going to show you how to use an open source project called TOBS or the observability stack in a Linode Kubernetes engine cluster to view important metrics about your Kubernetes based application platform. Hi, my name is Sid, also known as DevOps Directive here on YouTube, and I'm a developer advocate working with Linode. If you want to follow along with today's tutorial, there will be a link in the description that will give you $100 credit if you create a new account, which should be more than enough to get started. Without further ado, let's get into it. Now this is the guide that I'll be following along with today. It provides written documentation of all the steps that I'll be following, as well as some good descriptions of the different components. So you may want to pull that up alongside the video so that you can follow along as we go. There are a few prerequisites that we'll need to have installed on our system in order to make this work. The first of which is Helm. Helm is like a package manager for Kubernetes. Specifically, I'm using version 3.8.2. Uh, kubectl or kubectl is the command line interface for Kubernetes, so you want that installed. I'm using the, the client version, version 1.23. Uh, the Kubernetes cluster itself, we're going to spin one up here in a minute uh, using Linode Kubernetes Engine, but I'm using Kubernetes version 1.23. And then the Linode CLI, uh, which is just a way for me to interact with Linode via the command line so that I don't have to use the, the graphical user interface. Either way is fine. I just prefer to use the CLI. So if you don't have these already installed in your system, you want to go ahead and do that. Uh, for the Linode CLI, for example, there's these instructions on the Linode.com website. Uh, it does require Python, uh, and you would install it with pip. Some of the other ones, depending on whether you're on Windows or Mac or Linux, the installation instructions will be slightly different. So I would just suggest to Google for how to install them and find the relevant documentation from those projects. Let me get logged into the Linode website. So here I am on the Linode website. If we wanted to create a Kubernetes cluster via the interface here, we could just click Create Cluster and go through that process. Uh, instead, I'm actually going to do that with the CLI. Once you've installed the CLI, you would run the Linode CLI configure command. That would allow you to log in and get the necessary credentials into your, uh, into your shell so that you can interact with it. I've already gone ahead and done that. And then to create the actual cluster, we can run a command like this. It'll be Linode CLI and then LKE for Linode Kubernetes Engine, the cluster create command. And then these are the, the different information that I need to provide to the CLI about the cluster. So I'm naming it TOBS cluster for the observability stack. I'm putting it in the US central region uh, with Kubernetes version 1.23. And then the nodes in the cluster, I want three of these G6 standard two nodes. So if I hit return, it'll go off and create that. We can actually see that in the, in the web UI being created if we reload this page. It's not provisioned yet, but it's in the process of provisioning. And once that's done, we'll be able to get the cube config file and interact with that cluster directly. I'll go ahead and speed up this part of the video, and then we can resume once the cluster is done provisioning in just a few minutes. OK, so now a few minutes later, we can see that our Kubernetes endpoint is up, and at least one of our nodes is now running. Uh, we could download the cube config directly here and then point our command line to it. Uh, again, I'm going to use the command line interface. And so if I run Linode CLI list clusters, LKE list clusters, we can see this one cluster that I just created, and we can get that ID. I'm going to export that as cluster ID just so I can reuse it more easily later. Uh, and then I'm going to run the Linode CLI LKE uh, cube config view command. It's going to retrieve the cube config file from Linode. Uh, and then we'll actually place it here. We're going to get the output as JSON so that we can parse it. Uh, we'll pull the kubeconfig data from that. This is just manipulating that JSON output to specifically get the data that we need. I'm going to base64 decode it and then store it in this file in my home directory, .cube slash Linode kubeconfig. And so now I have a file there in my home directory. Uh, containing the necessary information to connect to this cluster. Obviously, this is sensitive information. I'm going to go ahead and delete this cluster when I'm done. You would need to protect these because these offer admin credentials to your cluster. At this point, I need to tell the kubectl uh, command line interface to use that kubeconfig file. And so we can do that with the kubeconfig environment variable. Uh, and I can tell it that we want to use that same file that I just wrote it to. And so now, if I do kubectl get nodes, we can see the three nodes in the cluster. Two of them are ready, 
and the third one is still being brought online. Okay, so now that we have provisioned our cluster and we can connect to it from our command line, we can go ahead and start following uh, this guide. The general steps are gonna be that we're going to deploy uh, something called the cert manager. And so cert manager allows us to provision certificates for things like HTTPS, uh, network connectivity, uh, and then we're gonna deploy the observability stack itself. And then I'm gonna deploy a sample application that we can use to exercise some of the different pieces of the observability stack and see how they all fit together and work. Uh, and then at the very end, we'll clean up uh, and, and remove these resources so that we don't end up getting charged for them down the road. And so that's the general process that we're gonna do. The, the sample application is a, a demonstration from Google called the microservices demo. Uh, that's pretty good. It has a bunch of different services that all work together uh, and generate some uh, load uh, onto the cluster. Uh, so in order to deploy cert manager, I'm gonna use Helm. As I said earlier, Helm is like a package manager for Kubernetes. Uh, and so the first thing that we'll do is add the repository where that Helm chart lives. Uh, in this case, I had already added it, but to do so, you would do Helm re repo add Jetstack uh, is the name, and then this is where the, the repository lives. Uh, we can then do a Helm repo update to make sure we have all the latest and greatest from all of our different repos that we have connected to. Uh, and finally, I like to do this before I deploy any Helm chart, is to run the Helm search repo command, and we're going to look at all the different versions of this, uh, this Helm, of this cert manager Helm chart. And so we can see there's lots of different versions available. And in this case, I'm going to install the very latest one, this 1.10.0. So when we run our install command, that's the one that we'll actually use. And so our install command is going to look like this. So we're going to do helm install. We're going to name the release cert manager. Uh, we're going to use the Jetstack cert manager chart into the cert manager namespace. And I'm gonna use the create namespace flag uh, so that it creates the namespace alongside uh, the, as we install this Helm chart. And then, like I said, we're gonna use the, the latest version, that v1.10.0. And then I'm gonna set install CRDs flag to true. So this sets a value within the Helm chart itself that tells it we want the additional custom resources necessary for cert manager to be installed alongside the operator. Uh, you could install those separately, but I want them all to be managed by Helm. Uh, so I'll just go ahead and, and use that flag here. Now this can take a little while. We can actually look at the resources that are being provisioned within that cert manager namespace. So we could do a cube cuddle get uh, pods and cert manager. And we can see it's actually creating, it's creating all the necessary resources associated with that operator. Okay, it looks like it's finished. Uh, Cert Manager has been deployed successfully. Uh, that's all we'll really need to do with that. Tops will take advantage of that behind the scenes. Now we can move on to install uh, the observability stack itself. Uh, similarly, we're gonna use a Helm chart. Uh, it is also in a different repo, so we'll need to add that repo just like before. We can do Helm repo add. Uh, we'll call it timescale, and the charts live at charts.timescale.com. Uh, we'll do a Helm repo update again. And we'll list out the versions of the timescale Tobs Helm chart that we care about. The latest version is the 17.4.0, so that's what I'm gonna use. And so in order to install it, uh, we'll again use the Helm install command. Uh, I'm gonna use the dash dash wait flag this time, and that will tell Helm to wait until all the resources that have successfully provisioned. Uh, I'm gonna name my release LKE monitor using the timescale Tobs Helm chart. And again, we're putting it into a new namespace. So it's the name, it's the monitoring namespace. And because that doesn't exist, I need to pass Helm this create namespace flag. And then I'm using that latest version that I saw, version 17.0.3. So let's go ahead and run that. And this can actually take a little while. There's a number of resources that need to be provisioned and some have to come up before the others can start. And so by using that wait flag, it will make sure that everything is up and healthy before we can actually go and try and use it. And so now that it's been running for a little while, it, we can get the pods in the monitoring namespace and we see that a whole bunch of different pods have been created. Later on in the video, we'll walk through what these different components do and showcase how we can use them to monitor our applications. 
we can see that most of them are healthy. We can see two of two containers in these pods running. This pod from a job has completed. Uh, there's a few that are still being started up though. We can see the database is not ready yet. Uh, and this prom scale depends on the database. So until the database comes up healthy, uh, this will not be able to start either. So this one will continue to crash until the database comes up and prompt scale can connect to it successfully. Now we're using pretty much all the default values for these Helm charts. If you wanted to uh, modify or customize them, the, the really cool thing about Helm charts is that the creators can specify a number of different parameters called values that when you install them, you can change. And so that allows them to provide a standard interface where let's say we wanted, instead of running our database in the cluster, like this time scale database here, we could have a point to a separate post Postgres instance with the time scale extensions. Uh, we could actually have that running outside the cluster and instead use those values file to tell the observability stack how to connect to it. Okay, it looks like everything just finished coming up successfully. And so it gives us some instructions here. We can see that it deployed. Uh, it configured Cube Prometheus. So this is a whole stack around Prometheus, which is a, a monitoring system. We'll talk through the various components, but it's for doing things like collecting and storing and, and querying against your CPU usage, your memory usage, all the different metrics within your cluster. Uh, Timescale DB uh, is the long-term storage engine for those metrics. Prometheus is great as a time series database, but it's not meant for long-term durable storage. So Timescale DB provides us a way to, to store those longer term. Promscale provides us a way to query against those data in a SQL with a SQL interface. Grafana is a really nice front end that allows us to visualize a lot of this stuff. And then open telemetry is a system and a standard for collecting telemetry data about your applications. And specifically we'll be showcasing how to use uh, tracing with the open telemetry uh, collector to collect traces from network requests and understand how long they're taking uh, and that sort of thing. Now we could just use these systems to monitor themselves, but it's much more informative if we have some other application workload in the cluster that we can use to look at. And so to do that, I'm gonna deploy a microservices demo from Google. Uh, and so that actually can be found here. Uh, so in the Google Cloud Platform GitHub organization, microservices demo, uh, we'll go ahead and, and clone that and then we'll deploy it. Uh, so I'll do a git clone uh, on that repo. Uh, and then the deployment manifests are all in this release file. And I'm just going to deploy this Kubernetes manifest.yaml. So I'll do uh, kubectl apply dash F. Uh, and I'm going to do it into the monitoring namespace. Uh, we could deploy it into its own namespace. We would have to do a little more setup in order to get some of the features working, uh, specifically the, the telemetry collection. Um, and so I'm going to deploy it into the monitoring resource, into the monitoring namespace for now. Uh, but just know you could deploy it elsewhere. You would just have to add some additional resources uh, to collect those traces um, if you wanted to do so. And so this will deploy uh, a number of different services associated with that. So it's, it's kind of a, a hypothetical online shop uh, that it deploys. Uh, and there's a number of services associated with uh, email or shipping or currency gen uh, conversion, um, ads, et cetera. And so it just provides a nice demo of the type of application that you might deploy into a Kubernetes cluster. Um, and once that's deployed, we can actually take a look at, at what this looks like on the front end. And we see this external IP, it uses a node port to allow us to connect to it. And so I can just go to this IP address and we can see this is the demo application that we deployed with all those services behind the scenes. Uh, but it's a, it's a make-believe online boutique. Uh, we can go and add stuff to our cart. Uh, we've got this recommendation engine providing us recommendation for other products, uh, et cetera, et cetera. We can convert from different, uh, from different currencies. So, the actual specifics of this don't matter, but what does matter is we have all these services that now we can use the observability stack to see what's going on, how much CPU and memory they're using. Uh, we can make some small tweaks to get tracing data, which is super cool. And we'll, we'll show that here in a second.
And so now we've, we've deployed that demonstration. And now let's go through all the different pieces of the observability stack and talk through what they're doing. Now this architecture image in the observability stack GitHub repo provides a nice visual of the different components and how they talk to each other. So I'll bring this up as we talk through the different pieces. Now, the first ones that we're gonna talk about are Prometheus, uh, Node Exporter, and Cube State Metrics. So Prometheus is a, a time series database designed for collecting metrics about distributed applications. It was actually created uh, at SoundCloud and then was open sourced and now has kind of become the standard for collecting data within Kubernetes clusters, uh, these types of metric data within clusters. And then Node Exporter and Cube State Metrics are two sources that feed data into Prometheus. So Node Exporter uh, actually collects data about CPU and memory usage and, and other resource usage on the nodes and sends those data to Prometheus. So we're able to collect, collect information about the, uh, the resources that our applications are using uh, and feed those into Prometheus where we can then consume them. Cube State Metrics interfaces with our Kubernetes control plane and the API uh, and reports out information about the Kubernetes resources themselves and also flows that into Prometheus where we can then interact with and query against them. Now, the next component that we'll call out is Alert Manager. So Alert Manager up here in the upper left, it is a system for managing alerts as the name implies. Uh, for example, let's say the API was unreachable, the, the Kubernetes API was unreachable, Prometheus would generate an event about that, send that to Alert Manager, and Alert Manager has a lot of functionality around things like deduplication uh, or managing or silencing alerts if, if they're no longer important to you, and also can interface with some other notification system, such as something like PagerDuty. And so Alert Manager could then be that interface to take those alerts, decide which of them you care about and which ones you want to flow uh, to be notified on. We can look at the Alert Manager interface uh, if we port forward to it. Uh, so we can use this kubectl in the monitoring namespace, the port forward command, and then we have the service name Elki Monitor Cube Prometheus Alert Manager uh, on port 9093. So this service is one that was set up by that Helm chart, uh, and that just happens to be the name of it, and the service is exposed on port 9093. And so if I run this command, and then we go to our browser and look at localhost 9093, we can see the uh, interface here for Alert Manager. Let me zoom in just a bit, and we can actually see one alert here. And this one isn't particularly interesting. It's basically saying an info level alert, so not a warning, not a critical. Um, those all get suppressed because generally they're not as important. And so this is just telling us there was at least one info level alert. And so that brings up this alert uh, here within Alert Manager. Uh, if we said, oh, this isn't as important, we can go ahead and si silence that, uh, et cetera, et cetera. I can say, this was me. Uh, and create, um, great. So now if we go back here and we can see that alert was now silenced, I can click the silence button to see it, uh, but if, if not, it goes away. And so that's about all we're gonna look at today for alert manager, but just know that if you did want to manage these alerts and potentially feed them somewhere else for a notification, this is the component where you would be able to do that. Now, the next portion of this diagram that I'll call your attention to is, is here with PromScale and TimescaleDB. DB. So earlier I mentioned that Prometheus is this timescale database for collecting and querying against these metrics. However, it's not really designed for long-term durable storage of those metrics. And so while we can store uh, multiple days or, or weeks of data within there, uh, in order to store it long-term, we actually ship it off to another system. And in this case, it's PromScale, which is backed by TimescaleDB. And TimescaleDB is a, a variant of Postgres with some additional functionality to make it uh, particularly well-suited for time series data. And so we'll flow those data from Prometheus through PromScale, and then they'll get stored in TimescaleDB. And PromScale provides us this nice SQL interface to interact with those data. The default installation of the observability stack deploys TimescaleDB as a stateful set within the cluster. And so if we go here, and look at the stateful sets within uh, the monitoring namespace, uh, we can see this timescale DB here. Uh, if you wanted to have that live outside the cluster, you could. You could 
you could provision that database elsewhere and then provide the connection uh, details, both the host name and the uh, password to connect in the values for the Helm chart in order for our, uh, our deployment of the observability stack to use that. And so that's just a, a slight nuance. If you do want to deploy it outside the cluster, uh, you'll have to follow a slightly different procedure and pass those values in when you deploy the Helm chart. Now, the next uh, portion of the observability stack that we'll want to talk about are over here in the, the right-hand side, these open telemetry boxes. Uh, as I mentioned, open telemetry is a, a open standard for defining uh, things and collecting information about metrics, logs, and traces. In this case, we're going to look specifically at the tracing data. And so we've installed the operator and the collector. And so that's going to allow us to feed trace data from our applications into uh, this collector, which will then pass it to PromScale, and we can then uh, query against it as it's stored in our database for pretty much any language that you would want to use. And so you could manually instrument your code. Um, however, for Python, Node.js, and Java specifically, there's a really cool auto instrumentation functionality where I can just add an annotation to my uh, Kubernetes pods, and the operator will automatically, it'll inject some additional code into my container that will override various libraries and instrument my network requests automatically. So I'll do that here in a bit when we take a look at this uh, in more depth, but just know we're using this piece of the stack to collect tracing information, network tracing information. Uh, and so we can see sort of how long different requests are taking, who they're between and that sort of thing. Now, open telemetry is, is really cool because it is this open standard. It allows you to implement or instrument your code once and it doesn't lock you into any particular vendor. So most of the uh, top vendors in this uh, observability space will support this open telemetry standard. And so once you've instrumented your code, uh, you can switch between them or, or decide which one fits your needs best uh, and use that. So you don't ne necessarily get locked in uh, to one particular vendor by using this. And now the final piece of the architecture here that we wanna talk about is Grafana. And so Grafana is essentially a, a front end for these uh, data stores. So we can use Grafana to query against Prometheus. We can use it via PromScale to query against our data in TimescaleDB. TB. And so that's the primary sort of interface that we'll be using to access the data that this observability stack is collecting. And so that's what we'll do here. Uh, that's what we'll do here. Uh, we'll, we'll connect to Grafana and use it to see some of the metrics that we're collecting uh, as well as uh, get some tracing data and view that as well. Now, when we deployed the observability stack, it actually generated a, a secret with a bunch of random entropy within it. And so in order to get that so that we can connect to it, uh, we need to run this command. So it's stored within a Kubernetes secret. Uh, so we'll get the secret in the monitoring namespace. The name of the secret that contains those data is the LKE monitor Grafana. We're gonna get it output as YAML. And then I'm gonna use YQ, which is a, a utility for interacting with YAML data to extract specifically the data field and the admin password field within that data field. Uh, and then I'm gonna pipe it to base64 decode, and that will give us the plain text password that we're gonna use to log in. And so this is the random password that was generated upon install. Uh, you could change this if you want, and the, the, the little node guide shows you how to do that. I'm just gonna use this password directly though. At this point, we need to port forward to the Grafana service. And so like before, when we port forwarded to the uh, alert manager service, we're gonna do it in the, the monitoring namespace. Uh, the service is named LKE monitor Grafana. And we're gonna go from my local host 8080 and forward that to port 80 uh, on the remote uh, pod. So once we've done that, we can now go in here to port 8080 and it should bring up the login interface for Grafana. Uh, the admin user is the one that was created. And then I'm going to grab this password uh, from that secret that I had before. And we're logged in. Now, there's a whole bunch of different uh, things that we can do here. We can create custom dashboards, but there's a bunch of dashboards that are provided out of the box. So if we just go here on the left-hand side uh, to this dashboards, uh, net menu and then click browse, we'll see a whole bunch of uh, dashboards that are pre-created for us. Uh, and what I'm gonna show is 
uh, information about our compute resources within uh, various name spaces. So if I go here, we can see these nice plots that are generated. Uh, and here we're looking at the cert manager namespace. We can see uh, it is using very little CPU. Um, but let's look at the uh, monitoring namespace where we have both the observability stack uh, pods running as well as that uh, microservices demo. And now we can see that uh, we can see each of the different pods and how much they're using. Uh, we can see that they're using about 40% of the requests, 17% uh, of their limits. Uh, and we can see for each of them, and we can do things like sort by the different fields. Uh, we can see the memory usage over time. So these are, are just really powerful visualizations that can give you insights into how the different how all of your different applications are performing. We can see the network usage uh, of each of our different pods. Uh, and so as you could imagine, this is super valuable information as you're going about uh, adjusting your applications, tuning their resource requests and limits. Uh, if you have a, a certain application that is gone awry, you can, you can find that very quickly with, with these types of dashboards. And so these are the types of data that you're collecting and you would want to and this is the reason that you would deploy something like the observability stack is so that you can get these types of insights across your applications very easily. Uh, not only can we get information about uh, applications running in the cluster, we can also get information uh, about the cluster itself. So we can go here and see information about the API server. Uh, we can uh, look at the compute resources across the cluster, kind of an aggregate, uh, and see that, oh, we're using about 26% of our total uh, cluster of our total cluster CPU, and we're using about 65% of our total memory uh, within the cluster. That gives us an overview of sort of most of these components over here on the left-hand side. We've seen Alert Manager. We've seen how these uh, sources are flowing into Prometheus, and then we're using Grafana to create dashboards that query those data and give us really important information about the applications running within our cluster. Next up, let's take a look at the, uh, the tracing data from our open telemetry uh, system. We can go to the explore option uh, and then it gives us the ability to choose which of these data sources we want to query from. But the one that I wanna look at is the prom scale tracing. And so there's no traces yet. Uh, and that is because we haven't enabled uh, that auto instrumentation on any of our applications yet. And so in order to do that, we're just gonna make a few tweaks to the YAML file that we use to deploy. And so I'll pull that up now. And so all we really need to do to add tracing because of this auto instrumentation feature is uh, add an annotation to the pod. And so I know that the email service uh, is written in Python. And so if I go here to the uh, template spec metadata uh, and then add an annotation section, within that annotation section specify open telemetry, inject Python true. And then also I'm gonna change this disable tracing flag from, from one to zero. And then recommendation engine or service is also written in Python. Uh, we're gonna do the exact same thing. We're gonna add an annotation to inject that. And then we're gonna go to the disable tracing zero. Uh, and then we'll just reapply this Kubernetes manifest. I uh, will see that the email service was configured and the recommendation service was, uh, it says unchanged. Oh, the service was unchanged. Uh, and the, the recommendation service deployment was configured. Uh, let's look at the pods. Uh, and we can see the recommend ser recommendation service is up and much more recent. So that's a new pod. Uh, and the email service looks like is up, but maybe crashing. Hmm. So let's revert the change on the email service. Let's leave tracing disabled there. See what that does. Okay, so with just the annotation, it comes up. Um, why? Hmm, okay. Let's look at the logs.
Okay, so something about how it's using that environment variable is a little off. Um, uh, let's just leave it there for now. It looks like our span IDs and trace IDs are getting properly generated. And so don't need to dig into the details of that for this video, um, but we now have auto-instrumented those two services. And if we go back to our Grafana interface, so I'll port forward there again, uh, and we navigate to our prompt scale tracing here, we go to search, we run our query. We can see our two services show up here. So if I click on recommendation service and run it, we can see uh, the network requests that are coming through uh, to, the net, to the recommendation service. We can see how long they're taking uh, if we click on one of them specifically. And so we can actually use those trace IDs to understand how uh, these different network requests are flowing through our system, how long they're taking, uh, et cetera. As you can see, we can check the different uh, endpoints where these are actually hitting. So these are the health checks uh, that are, those are returning super fast in 55 microseconds. Uh, some of the uh, more, some of the other endpoints, such as the send order confirmation uh, email service endpoint, uh, takes a bit longer at one millisecond. And so we can just see this. Gives, this gives us a way to uh, dive into how our services are performing, how long they're taking to respond. Uh, and so if you have an issue where something is, is becoming super slow, you can go in here and use this functionality to instrument your services and really dive into the specific issue at hand uh, and debug those. I only showed the auto instrumentation, which like I said, is available for a few of these languages, but there are uh, implementations for uh, clients for open telemetry for all of these different languages. So it's almost certain that whatever project you're running you'll be able to instrument it uh, with OpenTelemetry and feed those data using uh, the OpenTelemetry collector into this system. However, instead of just adding that annotation, you'd need to instrument your code base so that you'd be able to collect those traces. Okay, so that is it for the demo portion of the video. Uh, at this point, I'm gonna go ahead and clean up the Kubernetes cluster as well as the volumes associated with it. With it. Uh, and so I'll go ahead and do that now. Uh, the first step is going to be, I wanna figure out the uh, cluster ID again. Remember I said it earlier uh, and it was this. And so I can delete the cluster with this command, Linode CLI, LKE cluster delete, and then pass it that cluster ID. This is gonna go ahead and delete the cluster. I can go here on the interface uh, and see that that cluster no longer exists. Uh, and behind the scenes, when we deployed this, it created some volumes within Linode to persist the data associated with uh, Prometheus, associated with uh, Timescale DB, and associated with uh, Grafana and Alert Manager, kind of the application databases. And so as now that I've decommissioned the cluster, uh, these volumes will become unattached, and I can go ahead and clean them up as well. So I'll just do that. Uh, I can delete them here from within the interface, or I could use the... CLI, uh, we can see the volumes here and the ones that are not attached to any Linode, I'll go ahead and delete those. And so I can just do Linode CLI volumes delete uh, and I'll do this first one here. Looks like these last two have become unattached. And so if I refresh the page here in the interface, we should see all those volumes are now gone. Hopefully that overview gives you an idea of the power of the tools within the observability stack system and how you might use them within your application platforms built on Linode Kubernetes engine. If you have questions, feel free to ask them in the comment section below or let us know how you monitor your applications within Kubernetes. If you're looking to learn more about Kubernetes, check out some of the other video tutorials on the Linode YouTube channel. That's it for today. Take care.